in 2021, finally, we were able to get together and we just had a small hangout in New York. A woman actually told me that from my courses, she was able to get a new job, divorce her husband and pay for her childcare, which she wasn't able to do because she was like in a totally, an industry where that salary cap was just never going to happen. Okay, so today I'm really happy to welcome on the show Maggie Love, founder of SheFi. Welcome, Maggie. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. I used to have a boss called Mark Love. I was always very jealous of that surname. <laughs> D- different, different subject matter, but but cool name. Um, so uh, we describe SheFi as empowering female and non-binary professionals and entrepreneurs to succeed in frontier technologies. Uh, such as crypto, Web3, and AI, all the things that we love here. I believe you've been uh, collaborating with Hanan here at Outlier on uh, on a number of things, and we're looking to hopefully kind of ramp those up, obviously, across all those three areas, uh, but in particular, trying to get more um, female uh, women and non-binary founders into the program. I believe there was a CoinGecko report back in 2020, which really solidified, I guess, a, a viewpoint that you had that um, basically you know, DeFi at that point, 99% of uh, DeFi users were uh, male between 25 to 40. I'm not sure it's changed that much, to be honest with you, since then. Uh, although I'm sure you've been, um, make, weather has been changed, you've been uh, contributing towards that. But of course, that's probably representative uh, more broadly in terms of founders, users. You know, we always try to have as uh, balanced a program as possible, whether it's founders, co founders. Um, we find that easier in some categories than others. DeFi is uh, pretty consistently the one where we, we struggle the most. But let's let's get into your journey. It's been a really interesting one. You've done lots of stuff prior to Shefi. Can't wait to learn more about Shefi plans. Uh, I know you kind of got um, a good global reach. There's a few hubs that you're seeing a lot of traction in London, being one of them, which was which was really great to hear. But let's hear more about your journey leading up to Shefi and and what led you to found it. Yes. To go back to where I guess I fell down the rabbit hole, as they say, I was actually working at IBM Watson in Watson and Financial Services doing product strategy. So, you know, I went from AI, got into blockchain, and now dipping my toes back into AI. Uh, Through that role, I was in a corporate strategy meeting at IBM about technologies they should focus on in the financial services space. And, you know, we were in person in this big meeting room in Astor Place, which is a prominent building in New York City. But there was uh, one guy on the phone and he kept being like, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. We need to be talking about blockchain. And this was in 2016. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, can you mute that guy? Like, he's so um, annoying. Like, he won't stop talking about blockchain. And in my head, I was like, whoa, someone's really excited about something at IBM. Like, I need to go figure out what that is. So I went to Barnes & Noble, like a physical bookstore in Union Square, New York. I typed blockchain in their search bar. The blockchain revolution came up. I was like, okay, great. Purchased the physical book, read it in about two days. And it was really focused on all the use cases, like zero talk of a currency, really. Uh, Maybe about Bitcoin, but I can't remember. I just remember that wasn't my takeaway. And so from there, I was like, oh, I have to work in this space. Like, I don't fully grasp (laughs) what it is, but it sounds like it's the frontier. It sounds like you can do, uh, you know, create value for good in in new ways. And so I want to be a part of it. And so I kind of gave up my uh, Watson journey and just spent all of my free time pinging people on the internet. You know, there wasn't an ethereum.org website back in 2016. There was like Reddit and very few companies. Uh, Finally, through enough uh, internet searches, I made my way to Consensus, which is the Ethereum company building products uh, back in 2017. I got a job there on a team called Strategic Initiatives, which was just Joe Lubin's crew of people. He was like, either start your own venture or make a venture, you know, uh, scalable, like operationalize it. So it was a lot of ex-consultants and product people just given this, uh, you know, blank canvas to try to make something happen at Consensus, which was very much the vibe in 2017. Like, let's throw all these ideas on the wall of what a blockchain could reimagine and, uh, and run with it, you know, which is leads to a lot of exciting things happening, but also a lot of chaos. Um, 
So my first venture in the crypto space that I co-founded came along in 2018. It's called Web3 Cloud. And we really focus on building compute and storage infrastructure for Web3 protocols. So we focus a lot here on the software space, DeFi, ZK, uh, you know, Metaverse, uh, Web3 Social, that's all very software layer. Uh, but we know blockchains need hardware to run them. So we focus on like that Atoms layer, that physical infrastructure. And it was actually the third deal that came across my desk when I joined Consensus. So it was uh, early 2017, I just joined and Joe Lubin was like, hey, can you put together a presentation on, you know, uh, Ethereum, the a transition to proof of stake, like what that timeline is and, and like GPUs and infrastructure. And, you know, I wasn't exactly sure what that all meant, but I was like, sure, I'll figure it out. And I, I figured it out. Joe was like, this was a great presentation. Now will you close the deal for me? And long story short, uh, he was very inspired by this idea that the advanced micro devices, which is the partner in this venture had brought to the table, like, uh, there should be an infrastructure layer dedicated to blockchain protocols. And then, you know, I, at 27 years old, just went ahead and figured out how to close the deal. So I, so that was where I started in crypto. I worked on a couple other projects as well. Um, and then, you know, wasn't until 2019 uh, until when I had the idea for SheFi. So I'd been in the space a couple years uh, before I saw this opportunity uh, for SheFi. Yeah, and I know Consensus, Joe, whatever, has been, been criticized for... For, for that approach early on. But I actually think for that moment in time, it, it kind of made sense, right? Because it was it was so early, as you say, Ethereum had kind of only really just come online. Everything was up for grabs, right? Everyone was learning, everyone was trying to figure out limitations, possibilities. And so I guess that kind of um that kind of bottom up approach would make sense. And I know he empowered a lot of people. So it's great to hear you're one of them, right? What kind of learnings do you think you can take from that applied now to, you, you call them frontier technologies, other technologies that are coming through that are nascent, perhaps aren't yet at the commercialization phase. You know, what, what have you taken away from that? I don't know what you'd call it, really, the consensus. I know it's kind of like hub, hub and spoke model, or it was kind of like a venture studio, but it was also like an incubator. I'm interested to hear about what, what you learned from that that could be applied to other technologies. Yes, that time honestly was really fun, although chaotic and definitely had its challenges. A lot of people compare it to an early DAO structure where if you had an idea, there was this like pool of resources that you could then run with. And you had to excite people about your dia idea and people could kind of go from one team to another. Uh, teams were meant to cross pollinate and support each other. And we all frequently got on these like large meetings to hear what like everyone was working on. And, you know, definitely certain people had go, no go decisions, but it was pretty emergent. Things could bubble up, which was really the philosophy of blockchain and Ethereum technology. We don't need companies to necessarily fund ideas. Uh, we can have protocols uh, fund infrastructure and building. And so it really took that ethos from the technology that we're building upon and then tried its best to apply it, apply it to human coordination. And I think we can all agree that coordinating through DAOs and tokens and protocols uh, is one of the most challenging parts of the ecosystem that we're still working on. But something that I took away and I think many people took away was that um, you don't need, at least in the beginning, a ton of like VC money and to go through this whole fundraising process and uh, all this pitching to get your ideas started, right? Blockchains, I think, really enable... Uh, small teams to ideate quickly, maybe go find grants or not even need to find funding right away and like get something out there and get feedback and see where it goes. And there's all these different ways that you could figure out how to make it sustainable long term. But I think it really attracted a group of hacker like people. Even if you weren't a, a engineer or developer, you could still come with an idea, try to get people excited about it, and then be scrappy and how you, you know, continue to create value. So I think what came out of a consensus is a ton of founders out in the ecosystem building incredible products. Uh, maybe it was similar to the idea they had within consensus. Uh, maybe it's a totally new idea, but people hadn't left the ecosystem really. Uh, people just, you know, left consensus uh, to go start their own products. And I think it gave people that confidence to, you know, come with an idea 
and, you know, build something quickly, like a proof of concept, and then, you know, figure out, you know, how it gets funded, which I think is part consensus and part of the industry we're in where we have this ability to launch tokens and create value. We have like the blank canvas for that. So uh, it's easier to spin up your ideas in a lot of ways, especially if you are an engineering type. But I think that's really what it was, was this place where you could get started quickly and just kind of run with your crazy idea. And that continues to breed that confidence of like running with your crazy idea. Yeah. And I think kind of the, the consensus of alumni is obviously very strong. And I think we haven't even really yet fully, fully seen um, the impact that that kind of alumni network will make on the world. But you're right. As far as I'm aware, um, everyone I've worked with have come out of it. We've got a couple of outlier, both founders in our um, in our portfolio and then um, full-time staff members. And I think it's really interesting to think of it as that kind of proto, proto DAO, that fluidity of role and function, that cross-pollination, as you say. You know, perhaps it's actually the closest thing we've ever had to a functioning DAO because, of course, we know most DAOs are still uh, riddled with complexity and, and, and coordination issues. Before we get into um, Chief I, do you think that, given you have an AI background, something that we've been really interested on is the ability of AI tooling to continue to lower that barrier to kind of permissionless innovation that we've seen in web three because of its open source nature you know do you do you think that that is something that's going to continue this trend of needing less venture capital to kind of get to I guess, product market fit yes I definitely agree I think we're going to see the solopreneur term right so that's like one person who maybe has uh, a couple part-time employees maybe one part-time employee and like you know a full-time AI employee a 24/7 AI employee uh, help them get to the next level and once again get their idea out there get a product out there if you can build a product more quickly and get it out there and, and get users and start getting that uh, funding right that recurring revenue that's kind of that inflection point I know a lot of venture capital looks for is you know really product market fit and if it's easier to get to product market fit without a ton of funding uh, then I think founders will really I just think weigh their options more heavily like do I need to go the VC route uh, do I can I just bootstrap and I think we're gonna see way more solopreneurs and smaller teams and and hopefully not less people building but more people building different things and bringing more new ideas to the market. So I, I know people get stressed about like AIs taking jobs or how that impacts teams, but I think it's, it's more this creative multiplier and productivity multiplier. And what we really need to help people with is get the confidence to go out and start their own things. And so I really, I do think that will happen. I still think there's going to be a huge need for VC because, you know, trying to build large sustainable businesses uh, will definitely still have a place in the age of AI. But I do think we'll also see people starting with less and, and maybe that's good for the healthy for the whole ecosystem. Maybe, you know, billion dollar <laughs> valuations from PowerPoints uh, we've seen has kind of maybe been challenging when, you know, when we are dealing with the consequences of a macro economy that's has these interest rates and money's not free anymore. So I think in general, maybe you could just also just balance out, uh, how everyone that's a part of that funding ecosystem thinks about funding and valuations and and how they're examining projects. Yeah, and I think leading up to, to the topic of inclusion, one of the things that really excites us is the potential around uh, large language models for people to be able to effectively code through natural language or even to be able to just access the world's knowledge um, in a kind of conversational manner and through these kind of multilingual mediums, we've been playing around with some AI internally based upon some of our documentation, which of course is primarily in English, which precludes huge parts of the global population. Our mission being to kind of reach as many founders as possible. And interestingly, it just automatically translated. Like the advice it gives is multilingual, even though it hasn't translated the underlying documents, which kind of blew my mind really is to the, the potential for reach, you know, founders in parts of the world where it'd just be very challenging for us to do that, you know, language by language. So so maybe hopefully that's a, a reasonable segue um, in, into, into Shifi. So I know at the top end, we kind of said it, it, it spans frontier technologies. Obviously, Shifi is a play on DeFi. So I'm assuming that there's at its core, there's some kind of financial inclusion component or at least a core of the community were initially focused on, on DeFi and, 
and Web3? Yes, exactly. So I had the idea for Shifi in 2019. And that was, you know, my personal first bear market was 2018, right? I read the high of early 2018 down to the very low of 2018. And, uh, but in that time, in that space where things were cooling off and, you know, uh, once again, the hype had sort of died down. There was incredible building happening. And, and 2019 was really when we saw the DeFi rails being built, this foundational infrastructure. And so I was at Consensus at the time, and we used to work out of a flat in Bushwick. So once again, being able to just quickly run into people or hear what people were talking about was, uh, you know, an incredible, you know, ability to have ideas spark. You know, you hear something, you're like, wait, let me dig into that. I'm curious. So all of the males in my office were talking about like compound and 11% interest on their stable coins and all this stuff. And something that empowered me about joining crypto in 2017 was buying this Ethereum token because I saw builders, I met them, people were smart, things were happening. I used MetaMask, like a, a wallet, a product. And I was like, great, I don't have to be an accredited investor to uh, take advantage of, of this opportunity. That's exciting. And I'm really passionate about financial inclusion and, and literacy. But it wasn't until 2019 where that ability to actually make financial inclusion uh, more expansive than just like one token really came into play, which was through DeFi and not only allow people to uh, earn or leverage tokens, but leverage applications that could replace our banking systems that we have today. And them being permissionless mean, means that for the first time, your banking services aren't gated through KYC uh, or approvals or any of that. And so I heard people talking about it and then I happened to get a coffee with a friend who mentioned all, uh, you know, people were playing the NCAA bracket, which in the United States, there's March Madness, basketball teams, you bet on who's going to win and you, everyone contributes to a pot of money. And it just happened that all men decided to participate, but it was open to everybody. I always have to caveat. And uh, they mentioned that they put the pot in compound while the tournament was going on throughout the month, because if compound got hacked, like no big deal. Everyone put in 50 bucks, but you know, so no one, only one person was going to win it. So why not experiment with it? And for some reason we weren't even talking. I didn't even have the name for Shifa yet. We were just honestly getting a coffee and catching up. And I was like, that's such a good idea. Getting people to play with money that they have less attachment to, uh, in these new DeFi protocols as a way to, to kind of help people, get over their fear or their risk or the attachments they have to money and why maybe they're not doing something with it in the first place in this nascent technology. So that stuck with me. And then I happened to be home on a run listening to music, just playing around with this idea in my head, like decentralized finance, uh, people playing with their money. Could I do a bachelorette tournament? I don't really watch TV. So maybe that wouldn't work. And I was like, oh, maybe people would want to donate to charities. Like if they're giving up the money for a good cause, would they put in these protocols? Just playing with these words in my head. And then I was like, DeFi, SheFi. And I was like, wow, that that feels very like divinely inspired. Like it, it has to be my purpose because it just came to me out of, uh, out of like reflection, but also sort of out of thin air. So, you know, I, I went home, I told my parents and they're like, we don't even know what this is, but that's a great name. And so that really was like the beginnings of Shifi was this idea that women would come together, learn about a DeFi protocol, understand that, you know, on a lending protocol, the tokens were in liquidity pools. Liquidity pools are smart contracts. So understand when they're pressing the buttons, what's happening under the hood, not to a developer technical level, but to one, to a technical level where we're not glossing over that, understanding the impact, why it's important, what were money markets in traditional finance, how was Compound and Ave reimagining the structure in, uh, DeFi finance and giving them the whole picture, but then, you know, trying to encourage people to put their money in these protocols and see what happened. Now, when I started, I launched it in 2020. So around the time that CoinGecko article came out and I was like, great, I'm, I, my intuition was correct. Um, and so I started with a proof of concept cohort inside of consensus, like the women of consensus and people just loved it. And, you know, I thought I was going to do like uh, Ave, Compound, Uniswap, MakerDAO, 
I think Nexus Mutual was around that time, but like four or five DeFi protocols, oh, Uniswap to and be done with it. And then, you know, DeFi summer 2020 happened. And that was the summer of, you know, launching protocols, yield farming, uh, getting into that. DeFi really exploded. And, uh, you know, I just started creating more and more content. I ran my first public cohort in October of 2020. So women who were not at all close to crypto, I did it by just talking to friends, let them invite their friends of friends. And after the first class, I think I started with wallets. They were like, that was amazing. Like, I want more. And I was like, okay, so even my non-crypto community likes it. And it just grew from there. And you're correct in saying Shefi started as a play on the word DeFi. But when NFTs started happening, my community was like, what are NFTs? How do I purchase them or how do I leverage them or how do I build them? And then, you know, it was DAO summer last year. And so when DAOs happened, you know, how do I get involved? What does it mean to contribute? What should I be thinking about? What are these different structures? And, you know, there's always something new happening in the space. So really I've, you know, it's transitioned away just from this, you know, focus on DeFi, earn 11% on your tokens potentially to really this information can allow you to become an entrepreneur, can allow you to change your whole career. And, you know, much in the ethos of blockchains, reinventing all these systems, I think of it as a way for women and non-binary professionals to reinvent themselves. It's sort of new for everybody. We're at the beginning. Come and contribute now. It'll be a better ecosystem if more voices, uh, backgrounds, and experiences are contributing to it. And so it's really about making sure they understand the core use cases moving forward this industry and allowing them to get that um, promotion, change their career entirely, or start their own company in the space. And so it kind of grew as the interests grew of the community and as the ecosystem moved. And I'm just a nerd. So I like to know <laughs> everything that's going on and uh, I just learn it and, and then share it. Fascinating story. So what form does the community take and how has that evolved? So does it just start out as like a Discord server? And um, I know there's kind of a real world component to it as well. How's the, how's the community evolved and, and what kind of channels and forums do you leverage? Yes. Yeah, so the community uh, started and at its core is this virtual classroom and so you enter the community agreeing to this 13 weeks of a, you know, intensive educational program, uh, meet twice a week. It's about three hours, uh, content, demos, guest speaker, Q&A format. And, um, you know, after I, I ran this for the, the second time, I did my second cohort early 2021, we could get together for the first time. So it started virtual because it was born in the pandemic. I literally launched it from my best friend's house, apartment that I was living with in the pandemic and was like, I know this might not be a great time to talk about money, but if you do have the options, you should be thinking about these new investments and new technologies. And so in 2021, finally, we were able to get together and we just had a small hangout in New York. And um, a woman actually told me that from my courses, she was able to get a new job, divorce her husband and pay for her childcare, which she wasn't able to do because she was like in a totally, an industry where that salary cap was just never going to happen. Um, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> like I definitely had tears in my eyes and, you know, I'm not advocating for divorce, but I realized that not the class is incredibly important, but so is gathering this with, with this community, you know, sharing stories, um, continuing to potentially get a job. People have gotten jobs from Shifi meetups. So after I kind of had that first in-person magic, I was like, okay, I, this can't just be a course. This has to be a whole community and I want to continue to find ways to engage it. So we have the virtual classroom. Of course we have discord and telegram and email, like we all are fragmented across multiple virtual channels. Uh, within the community, we have two clubs that have arisen, which is an investment club. So they talk about different opportunities in the space and bring in guest speakers. We have a technical club for our more technically uh, minded group and people that actually just want to learn. So people are learning coding, GitHub, all of these uh, tools as well. And then we've decided in the last year to have local chapter leads. So those are in your major cities. And, and Shiva is actually in 50 plus countries, um, which is 
really incredible to think about. If I think about clicking the send button on my first blog post from lockdown to today. And so the chapter leads are uh, asked to get people together casually three times a year and one time a year, you know, partner with Outlier Ventures in London or Ave or let's say one of the the protocols in in the space and bring people together for like a more educational event. So we have people in London, Paris, uh, Lagos, Nigeria, San Francisco, uh, Mexico City, you know, a lot of different places where members are getting together in person. And then the, f- the final component would be what we just had many outlier ventures um, people attend, which was the Shifai Summit in Paris. So that was our first attempt at a premier event, which was a wild success. I mean, I was totally on cloud nine when I looked out and saw a full audience. So we had over 300 people come out during the day. We ran an experiment with PoApps apps where people could mint PoApps, apps, which for those who don't know, they're NFTs, uh, basically that you can, uh, receive to your wallet and 662 PoApps apps were minted. And we did it for each talk and 65 people minted all talks. So there was like 12 talks and they got a free t-shirt. We experimented with airdropping digital goods. And, uh, so that's, you know, our next big venture. And we'll definitely want to do more of them because it was, there's clearly just such an appetite, uh, to come and hear experts and to engage in web three native ways throughout the day and, uh, and network. We provided a lot of opportunities for networking. So, Zoom, Discord, Telegram, in-person events uh, throughout the world is is how we come together. Very cool. And are you looking at, you mentioned you, you kind of have to do this initial course and you have plenty of other courses after it. Are you looking at kind of accreditation as well? So the ability to have credentials that you've done the course and, and kind of level up and for these to effectively be a, a qualification? Yes, I haven't looked in the process for formal certification, but uh, we launched something this year in the spring, our own NFT, which is an earnable av- avatar. It's called the Shifai Robo Nova because the three pillars of Shifai are education, experimentation, and community. And so when I was putting it together in the beginning, it was like, You can learn if you read and read and read, but things don't really click until you hold your breath while you send your first transaction or mint the NFT and hope the NFT shows up in your wallet. So we have this earnable avatar. And as you do different activities, so as you bridge your tokens to a layer two, or as you swap on Uniswap, or, you know, it can also be off-chain data as you come to 20 Shifi events, you can unlock traits on this avatar. And then, you know, basically how fancy your avatar gets is your ability to show the world. Like I've been really engaged. I've done all the activities and that is tracked through your wallet activity. And then, you know, we also have an ability for the off chain data to be, you know, manually added as well. So that's our own, you know, beginning of, of certification. Yeah. And I think, look, you know, what, what do you need to become formal for? I mean, that's as formal as you're going to get, right. If you have, um, a community that puts together the kind of content programs as carefully as as you you do. You know, why would you need that to be recognized in in a traditional academic sense? Very cool. Just on on the topic of DeFi before we go elsewhere, one of the challenges with, I guess, the financial education around DeFi is how you navigate it not being investment advice or this kind of stuff, especially in a US context. How have you managed that organizationally, is it is it actually relatively easy? But I, I know it's put off a lot of people putting out too much content that might otherwise help people uh, for kind of fear that it's, it's seen somehow as promoting one particular protocol or one particular, you know, product offering. I definitely hear a lot about like making things credibly neutral in this space when it comes from a content building perspective. And, you know, I don't give out any investment advice. People ask me and I just say, hey, I'm teaching these foundational use cases and protocols uh, because I know that they stand the test of time. Like, you know, I'll teach an Aave or a Uniswap uh, when I'm explaining lending or I'm explaining decentralized exchanges because people need to see and be able to do these things somewhere, like I said, in order for it to click. But I'm never like, oh, and therefore, you know, you should buy some uni tokens. They're highly discounted. Uniswap V4 is coming out. And so I just, 
frame it in the way that like, I am your trusted guide. And these are the use cases and teams that I think are doing an excellent job and, you know, let people go from there. I've also provided information on how to examine investment opportunities, right? Like if you're going on Coinbase, like that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good investment. Coinbase does a better job than Uniswap. As we know, Uniswap's totally permissionless, but Hey, this is what you need to look at. You know, uh, how much tokens are in circulation? Have you checked to see if the team has their Discord, their GitHub? You know, I, I've given out you know advice in terms of how you look at opportunities and make sure they're real, uh, but I have never given out like direct X by X Y Z, and I think that's important in the, in this space too. Like, I'm really giving people tools. Uh, but, you know, if someone asks a question in Discord, like, have you heard of this project? Or when people get together to discuss it, uh, then, you know, people are just adults discussing opportunities. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily come from me do X, Y, Z. It's like, look at these products that are uh, never been hacked, upstanding, uh, pushing, pushing things forward. And then if you're enjoying the product you're using and you think that, wow, this is really going to be a gangbuster project, then I'll let you kind of determine from there what your next step is. So kind of coming back to the point around, um, inclusion, education, I really like this idea about enabling people to reinvent themselves. I think it's a great way to bring people into the space to actually be able to match existing skill sets that they might have might be professional might be otherwise and transfer them in, in into web3 but how do you frame the the problem around inclusion especially in the context of, of female and non, non-binary professionals um, and then more generally is 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 there a root problem is it that simple or is it it's more systemic and actually, you need to attack it in, in a number of different ways proactively. Uh, the first question, how do I frame inclusion in this space? Well, I think in this space, especially in the beginning, there was a lot of, well, permissionless technology means it's it's an inherently inclusive, right? Once again, anyone can go up and download their Web3 user uh, custody wa- wallet, right? They don't need to put in their information. The blockchain doesn't care who you are when you're transacting on it or using an application. And so I think there was just a lot of thinking that that means we're doing better than traditional industries. So what people were missing or how I frame inclusion is if we build it, they will come is, is not the right attitude. Even if now they are allowed to come without having to give up any information to do so. So you can't, you know, discriminate our, our bare access to things. And I think that was just a little bit of hubris in the beginning of this, this young ecosystems idea of, you know, what it meant to build great products and make sure people know about it and are contributing to it. Uh, so I think that I frame it as like, yes, it's a permissionless technology, but you still need efforts to reach out to people to let them know it exists. And you likely need to go out of your direct sphere of influence uh, because, you know, if you are a male, it's more likely the people you're talking to and sharing this information with also identify the same because of the way that we exist as a society. And, um, so I, I think there's that. And I think that the next big problem is, and what I really try to break down in Shifi is it's a whole new language. You know, it's, it's like, it's basically like getting a, a, a finance degree or a legal degree or any, uh, maybe not like getting the degree, but those are groups of people and industries that have their whole own dialects. And so, um, if you weren't even in the finance or tech space to begin with, you're way behind on on the language and understanding. And a lot of engineers building this technology, you know, were coming up with terms that made sense to them in that moment, but they weren't necessarily thinking about the end user who is your grandpa or, you know, some other family member who is less tech literate. So I think that there was kind of this like permissionless technology means equals inclusion, which it doesn't. And then also like not understanding that, uh, there is this whole new language we've created and that's a huge barrier to entry. And really what I try to do at Shifi is break down what that dictionary is, what that language is, and also relate it to the tech and financial concepts that were taken from the traditional space, 
and, and, and try to like put it into context of like what else is, is also going down. A great example is when SVB Silicon Valley bank blew up, which was a more traditional financial infrastructure banking blow up because of the stable coin part, it did have an impact on the space and you can highlight points of centralization still being negative and, and inherently why we want decentralized systems and why you want to manage your own funds. And so making those connection points is really an, important because crypto doesn't exist in this vacuum anymore. And it really never has, uh, maybe except for the very early days. So that's, you know, how I think about making it more inclusive and accessible. Well, I mean, so, so that was the framing. And then I, I guess it's how you, how you then approach that. So for example, we attract founders in different ways. Referrals is one, of course, actually a big driver um, for us of, of quality founders. But again, um, if you've got largely um, certain demographics represented, you're, you're going to get referrals, you know, similar. When we try and do, say, activations, online activations, well, a lot of users use Brave. And so actually you have no to little demographic data on them. You can't really target them in a demographic sense. Of course, you can on things like LinkedIn. Um, so it, it's actually quite difficult uh, unless, well, to identify people who may be curious, may be participating on the periphery of the space and kind of, you know, use them through uh, traditional advertising channels. Um, so yeah, how do you go about tackling that? Yes. Well, I think the easiest thing for me and, and people ask this question often is like, my brand is literally called Shifi. <laughs> so it already, um, you know, I, I probably wouldn't even have to say that I'm empowering. I could say empowering professionals and entrepreneurs, but just the name Shifi itself, we get very few, men in, in our enrollment forms or applications. Now, trust me, plenty of my male peers are like, wait, I would like to take that course. Like, and so, but, you know, I think just by, uh, because we're not trying to appeal to everybody, it's very easy for us to brand and be specific and targeted. And you come to our page and you, if you're, if you identify as a woman or non-binary folk, you're like, oh, this is, this is for me. Like, there's no question that Shifi is not for me. So I think that, you know, I had to make the decision very early on that, you know, I'm going to stick to this uh, group of people who identify this way and build it for them. And, you know, I think that really helps uh, Shifi. And another thing is we also grow heavily on referrals. My goal is when someone takes the Shifi course that they have like the best experience they've had. We start each class with music. I try to keep it interactive. I try to bring in the best experts to talk to uh, the community, I trying to think of new fun ways to show off your engagement. And so I put all of my effort into being like, how can I create the best experience, uh, for this person? And once again, that's how we grow on referrals. Now I'm excited for in the future. I, and I haven't really dipped my toes into this yet, but there's all these NFT communities now and DAOs that, you know, um, identify with female PFPs or for, uh, female and non-binary folks. And so we haven't necessarily offered slots to those communities yet. Um, we do some co-marketing, but that's also another new avenue. And so I think when all these messaging apps like XMTP, uh, well, you know, they are embedded into apps, but let's say that you can target based on NFTs, you know, people have and, and wallet messaging. I think that'll start to make our lives a bit easier if they're somebody who likes to showcase who they are based on their wallet. It won't be perfect because there's a lot of people who bought female PFPs because they thought the price was going to go up only. But I think uh, I'm excited for that next phase. Um, and yeah, and right now, like a, we're still kind of that organization that's like hustling for each sign up. Uh, but I am very grateful that we have a product that people love talking about or a community that loves talking and, and you know, kind of comes in and has this experience and wants to shout about it and tell people about it. Yeah. And I think there was this, uh, this hope or assumption that NFTs would bring in a wider kind of demographic of uh, founder and user into space. They definitely did from a founder perspective. Um, disproportionately, if you look at the, the founders in our portfolio, the female or non-binary, it's heavily skewed towards uh, NFTs. But of course, NFTs aren't doing so well now. Now, 
we all know that that might not last forever. It's going to evolve um, away from perhaps quite narrow PFP, as you say, very speculative um, use cases. Hopefully, some of those people that came in with NFTs stick around, but I don't think we can kind of you know necessarily rely on that. So I know the team at Outlier really value you as, as a as a partner, you your community as a partner. Um, yeah, because it is otherwise very hard to to kind of to to reach. So may, maybe we kind of uh, zoom out a little bit. I saw recently that you were tweeting enthusiastically about the recent new about PayPal um, and the launch of their stablecoin. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, and then also what trends you're you're most excited about in Web three. Yeah, very excited about about PayPal. I can't say my experience on PayPal has always been the most user friendly, uh, but. I do think that, you know, the most exciting headlines we've seen in terms of like user adoption has been, uh, you know, applications in the Web2 space that have tons of users experimenting in the Web3 space are adding in Web3 rails. We had the Reddit avatars, they branded them as collectibles, right? That onboarded millions of people, uh, got wallets for that last year. I was excited when Starbucks came out uh, because it has such a strong brand and engagement and point system. And I just thought that was like one of the perfect uh, companies to really take hold of this. We've seen some stuff in the luxury space as well. Um, and so I think that while we like are not in this like NFT PFP space, which I'll be frank with the NFT ecosystem, your, you, your users were probably not everyday people or buyers. They were a type, a class of investors. They were a specific type of class of investors. And so these other applications like PayPal, which has a user base of basically anybody that needs to send a payment uh, in a you know in a non traditional rail uh, already existing, and now adding in the stablecoin and the stablecoins on Ethereum, which is exciting because it means then it's basically on every layer two or anything that bridges from Ethereum, right? It, it benefits from being able to be on these other networks that are cheaper and faster, like an Optimism or a Polygon. You know, it's it's going to be auditable. So it's backed by US dollars. So that's exciting, but also, you know, still centralized. And uh, they're going to go through an auditing process. And I believe, you know, I, the, the number is around, I think it was 223 million uh, users already on PayPal. And so at first it'll be for US citizens, but that means eventually, you know, 223 people could take the advantage of peer-to-peer uh, -peer global payments. Uh, you know, I think... Payments is this like use case we don't like to talk about because it's like not exciting, but I've thrown events all over the world now. And I can tell you, I'd much rather send a stable coin in PayPal that will settle in seconds and requires me like knowing their username rather than going to like moneytransfer.com, putting in their address, all their personal banking information, the cut being like $75 plus what if it's in, you know, a currency that's not the US dollar that's you know more expensive i'm paying like $750 instead of like 600 something right so that process is so painful that like this is just lights out going to be such a better experience for people and they won't have to download wallets they won't have to manage seed phrases or secret phrases and i think that's you know a big move forward for inclusion. Now, I know people are listening to this and they're going to be like, yes, but you know, at the end of the day, they're not, not your keys, not your crypto. So it's not in their user custodial wallet to start out. Uh, PayPal does censor people and not allow them to access it. Like, yes, that's true. And it's a, a stable coin collateralized by the US dollar and treasuries, which means it's not fully on chain, right? We're still once again, relying on the health of the US banking system, the policies of the US government, uh, it's localized to, to that, even though it's a global stable coin. So yes, those are the risks of centralization. But I we're coming to a place where how centralized decentralized is it is going to always be a spectrum. And there's going to be a use case for different type of people. People will not mind a stable coin backed by the US dollar, uh, all over the world, they'll be very excited about that. And they'll be really excited. They can access it through an app in their phone rather than, you know, teaching them to manage all the difficulties around a wallet. Um, 
So I'm very excited about that, uh, understanding its limitations, but understanding in a world of 4 billion people, there's going to be products for for many, many millions of, of different types of people. Other uh, things I'm really excited about, I think this is like some of the you know things we're all talking about. So I was just complaining about wallets and writing down your seed phrase and private key. I literally mentioned that like 15 times in my wallet presentation, like do not put it on your computer, do not put it in your password manager write it down. It takes two minutes. Um, but account abstraction, right? Which is just being able to have different types of wallets, wallets from emails, wallets, uh, you don't need crypto to get started in. So just once again, different types of wallets for different types of use cases, not all of them need you to write down a seed phrase and, uh, private keys and all this other stuff. I'm, um, very excited about uh, zero knowledge technology and its ability to help us um, with expensive fees, but also be privacy enabled, which is going to be like hugely important in the future. And I'm also, um, you know, I'm, I'm super excited to see how like AI interacts with the blockchain. Uh, I don't, you know, I think people got a little stressed when they saw like everyone just going from being like a crypto thought leader to an AI thought leader, um, on, on Twitter, those thought leaders have also died down a bit, but I think that, you know, it's going to be a huge unlock in terms of the type of functions and programming that's built. And I think we will want to keep a lot of this, uh, data decentralized and think about how we have, you know, large language models computing over decentralized data. And I think that, you know, it will only enhance this movement to keep infrastructure and technologies uh, decentralized. So I'm excited about uh, diving into all those things as well uh, coming up in in this next GFI season. Oh, great. And they're all things that you're going to be covering in, in specific content modules, right? So. Yes. So uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, likely ZK EVM enabled layer twos. So how, what is zero knowledge and then how that uh, helps these new layer twos be cheaper, faster, more user-friendly. Uh, we'll be talking about AI. So what are large link? There's like all this terminology in AI too. So like, what's all this terminology? And then like, what are the tools that you as a business person can start leveraging, whether you're a solopreneur to supercharge your creativity? Like, how can you see it as a friend? And uh, like, I use AI every day. So um, how it like, you know, empowers me to do more uh, with less. And so not only what it is, but how you'll use it. And then when we talk about wallets, you know, I think people will start to interact with different types of wallets, ones that are allegedly enabled through account abstraction, which I really dislike that term. So hopefully we come up with something better soon. Uh, but you know, how that works. And, you know, there's like, wallet as a service now and all this, all this stuff coming up. And we'll then we'll also cover governance and, and public goods. So I'm excited to dive into where governance has failed. Cause we've seen a lot of that, like a lot of DAOs are, are shutting down and, you know, where people are trying to rethink it and, uh, and, you know, enable it to be something that people participate in, I guess, <laughs> participate in and scalable. And I, and I think we'll get there. And I think governance is a super inspiring idea. Like you don't like your politician, remove your tokens and put it somewhere else. Or you don't like this thing, do this. But, um, we still have a long way to go in like enabling that and allowing people who don't have a lot of tokens to get involved. So I'm excited to see where we are today and, and where we can potentially go. Very cool. Well, look, thanks for coming on the show. It's been fascinating talking to you, hearing your journey. A big thank you from everyone at Outlier, as well as the wider community for helping grow the space, grow Web3, make it more accessible, um, help it reach more people. How can people get in touch with you, find various programs, courses that you're running or events? Yes. I think the best way would be to follow us on x.com. So Twitter, for, that's the, that translation. Uh, the SheFi handle is she underscore underscore FI. I like got that in 2019 and I never thought to switch it. So that's what it is. And then, you know, I'm always uh, available. Feel free to reach out. I'm easier. I'm Maggie Love underscore. And then from our Twitter, you'll see in our bio, you know, where you can enroll in our course, uh, where you can find our website. So that should be an easy place. But if for some reason you can't find something, uh, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter 
at the Shefi account or my personal account. Okay, well, highly recommend people do that. Um, as you said, there's lots of courses that you've got, especially in, in DeFi that I would uh, probably quite like <laughs> myself, probably, probably need just to be able to do my job uh, without feeling constantly out, out of depth. Um, Maggie, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. 